picking a filter for your telescope, whether it's a refractor, whatever, is a difficult decision. These things are not cheap. And some of these filters now can get into, well, over a thousand dollars. What I want to talk about today is the Itis NBZ filter. Now, this is a high speed filter that I use on my Rasa 8 telescope. It's very popular. A lot of people have spoken about it. I want to show you guys some examples and go into a little bit more of a deep dive about the filter coming up now on the channel. Hey guys, it's Chad. Welcome back to the Easy Astro Image channel. If you are new here, please subscribe and like there's going to be a lot of content coming up because we are just rocking and rolling and once we get that rasa back in our hands we're going to be doing even more it's at celestron right now getting tuned up a little bit because i sent them some images and they agreed that they would work on it a little bit for me but we have that octopi octopi space adapter that we are going to be installing on the rasa to hopefully make our image just look awesome from corner to corner, or we're going to try. So here is the filter that we're talking about. And don't be confused about the NBX. The NBX was the first version of this, which was quickly replaced free of charge to those who bought it, by the way, by Idis with the NBZ. And the reason why is that it created halos. Halos are a kind of a big issue with the Rasa. This eliminates them. In fact, even though this is a duo narrowband filter, meaning that it will pick up like your hydrogen and your oxygen at the same time, and you can process that stuff out and do some cool color palette stuff with a one shot color camera, it actually does a really good job. If you're going to play around with color correcting and you want to spend a little bit more time on it on any other pictures that you could take broadband and the like on your Rasa. That way you don't have to worry about halos ever. So if we take a look at a couple examples here inside of PixInsight, you're going to see on the left, this is a broadband regular light pollution filter shot with my Radian Raptor 61. I also have some images that I'm working on right now with the Raptor 61 that I shot with this filter. But since it's more tailored toward the Rasa, I figured we would go ahead and focus on that. But yeah, you can use this filter on any type of scope. It just happens to work better with the faster F2 scope. And you can see the difference between the two images here. How this one over here on the left looks a little bit orangey and there's a little bit of whiteness inside there. Where when you look right here, you can really see that there is a true def defining area of oxygen and hydrogen and this isn't the best type of image for to show off what this can do but i'll show you a couple of those here real quick so right here is one of my favorite images that i took with the rasa i think back in october when we actually had a clear night and this is of course of the elephant trunk in the surrounding area and you can see that when you have the deviation of the bands that you're able to like pull out all of the different colors. And that's the great thing about the MBC. So the, there are a couple few things about it though. If you hold your filter up to the light, you'll notice that there's kind of a cast from like a bluish to like a purple on that filter. And obviously that's there for a reason, the way it's designed and everything else. And interestingly enough, that does show up in your images. I don't have any gradients or anything at all in any of my images that I shoot, but you can plainly see right here in these two examples of the Heart Nebula that I have gradients in both of them. And looking on the screen here, the one on the left is actually ran through just the normal weighted batch pre process here in PixInsight, and it hasn't been no dynamic background extraction, no color calibration or anything like that. The purpose of this experiment was to use and compare the normalized scale gradient process that is built into PixInsight. And you can see that it cleaned a little bit of that stuff up pretty well, not too bad. So if I were to process and work with either one of these images, it definitely would be the NSG image. 
So if you're shooting Nebula and you're seeing something like this in your image, you're definitely going to want to run it through both of them and see exactly which one gives you the better results. Here's an example of that elephant trunk that I did. And you can see the same thing that there's kind of like the cast where this side is a little bit more bluer. This is a little bit more red, just kind of the way that things just kind of seem to work with this filter, but it all does seem to kind of balance out and we can do that real quickly by just running a normal dynamic background extraction on the image itself. So we'll just do that here real quick and I'll show you guys exactly what kind of results uh, you can expect if you do something like that. So we'll make the image a little bit bigger here so everybody can kind of see what's going on. And we're not gonna worry about cropping or doing anything like that. We're just gonna go straight to the dynamic background extraction. And I have my parameters all preset here. I'm gonna make my boxes a little bit bigger so there's not as many of them. And it will sample a lot more of the background. And we don't wanna get any nebula in there. I follow pretty much all the processing techniques. Um, when it comes to the DBE, at least from uh, Sean over at Visible Dark, um, he's pretty much like a Pixinsight genius, uh, but there are things that he does the hard way, in my opinion, that I'll just never do um, as far as when it comes to processing and spending hours on images. I kinda am one of those instant gratification guys. That's why I love the Rasa so much because it does everything so fast. So I've got everything set up here. I'm gonna pull this down as a new instance so we can do the division first and then the subtraction. So if we do a division here and we let it run and turn the stretch on, you can see that it definitely fixed a lot of that stuff that was going on. And we'll go ahead and bring that back up. And now we're going to do a subtraction on this. And that will get rid of a little bit more. And there you go. If I brought up the rejection maps, we could probably see even more. In fact, let's do that. Let's go ahead and bring up this image right here. And let's create the same thing with the dynamic background extraction and we will pull up and look at the actual rejection map so we can see exactly what is going on inside there. So let's do a division again, and now it's gonna create a couple things for us. So this is it right here, and let's stretch that out, and yeah, there you go. Take a look at that, that type of a gradient that we're getting. And granted, this was from my Rasa, which, you know, the Rasa's got a lot of problems. I have it in Celestron right now. We know that there's tilt, curvature issues, and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully with that Octopi adapter, we'll be able to sort out a lot of that stuff. But, you know, there is a kind of an example of what kind of gradient you can see that we're getting, you know, either from the MBZ or from misalignment. But luckily, everything does color balance out really good, and it does exactly like it is supposed to. Here's a look at the veil, and the same thing. We've got kind of like a cast going from left to right. But again, this all will come out no problem if we take a look at the actual image itself here that I ended up, uh, ended up with. Um, and interestingly enough, APP does a pretty good job with this too. If we uh, pull up the APP image here, which is uh, should be color balanced and not stretched, you can see that uh, go ahead and using their algorithm on this image that it corrects almost all that. And I would go ahead and have no problem starting to process this image right here. Now here is one of my favorite images that I've done to date. And this was using uh, Luke's techniques when it comes to reassigning colors and everything with pixel math and combining everything together. This of course is of the Cygnus wall and you can see just how awesome it is using this du duo narrow band filter to kind of do all of these false color type of images. 
This one here is one that I am super proud of, and I cannot wait to shoot this target again next year. You can see that I had to eliminate a lot of it because of just, you know, the horrible field that I had with the Rasa, but we were able to just go ahead and, you know, I've learned so much in the past four or five months that I would like to actually probably run back through this data again and see what we could actually pull out of it. Maybe we'll do that in another video. It's always good to revisit your old stuff when you learn new techniques, especially those favorite ones like this. I've actually just added another couple terabytes of storage to the PC so that way we can store a lot more and we can do all that fun stuff four years down the road. And of course, since we have the original lights and I still have the 2600 camera, I can just keep on adding to this year after year after year. Bonus. So that's it, guys. Let me know what you think. Are you happy with the MBZ? Are you interested in the MBZ? I think it is the way to go. I know I've seen a lot of people on the Rasa Facebook groups that I respect that use this for electronic uh, astronomy that I do with like SharpCap and the Rasa, being able to sit there and actually observe uh, target after target with like 15 to 30 minutes of integration. It will actually pull out and divide colors and everything is great. I take those images and I can kind of dump them in and play with them a little bit. AI denoise them and hey, they look okay for Facebook, but they don't look like that Cygnus wall did. But anyway, thanks guys for stopping by. Like and subscribe to this video if you enjoy this content and peace.